Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to go deeper than ever before on some of the arguments that John Lynn makes in his attack against the Declaration of Independence. Now, I feel I've quoted him uh, fairly in these last videos, but um, I've had to prevent the historical context and discuss the events that are were happening at the time he wrote, because obviously he knows his audience is gonna know what he's referring to. But for mod modern audiences, I've tried to fill in the details. And of course, that takes time away from letting John Lynn speak. So today we're gonna give him more airtime than usual and see how he defends the quartering of soldiers. Now, all school kids learn about the quartering of soldiers as the one of the events that leads to the American Revolution. But how would you defend it? John Lynn tries, and we're gonna see what he says at length. Stick around. It's time for another episode of the History Behind the Headlines. This is Bashing and Thrashing the Declaration of Independence, Part 4, Quartering of Soldiers. So if this is the first time you visited this channel, as you can see, it's part four. I'm not going to get into much of an introduction. I recommend that you start watching these videos with part one so you can figure out why we're doing this topic today. Otherwise, stick around and then we'll get right to it. So John Lynn calls the argument against the quartering of soldiers a pretense, something fake. And it's so arrogantly set up by these local subordinate legislatures. And this is what subordinate legislators look like. You have the king at the top, you have parliament, and then of course you have the colonies way at the bottom. Now, were the 13 colonies and their assemblies subordinate legally to the British crown? Well, yes, technically they were. And so that's why they were declaring their independence so that they could no longer be subject to the wishes of those who were in power. Now, now Lynn goes on to say, these subordinate legislators are doing nothing more than dictating to his majesty in what parts of his empire he may or may not station his troops. Again, that was a valid point. The colonies were, in fact, saying, yes, we don't want your troops stationed here. But, of course, you got to understand, uh, imagine the perspective of uh, the king to think that the audacity of his subjects to tell him where he can put and not put his troops in his colonies at this time. They're still his. But now wait. There's more. Because John Lynn says that if he were to just stop there, that would be to do injustice to his majesty. In other words, that could end the argument, but he's just not going to stop it there. And so, of course, you know, we don't want to do uh, injustice to even the dead king. So we'll go ahead and let him finish his argument here. Not to say that the king, in doing what he did, he exercised only a prerogative, legal, constitutional, and hitherto unquestioned, is indeed fully to defend the measure is to obviate every legal objection that can be made against it. But this is not enough. The measure deserves praise. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that not only can you defend it from a legal standpoint, the king is not doing anything wrong here, but more than that, this act of quartering soldiers should have been praised by the 13 colonies. Okay, so let's continue following his reasoning. Why should it have been praised? He asks, when was it that the troops were stationed in America? At the close of the war. And of course, he is talking about, but he doesn't mention it, the French and Indian War. That is, he doesn't uh, mention it by name. And so that's why there were British troops in and around the colonies at that time. Now, during the war, Great Britain had paid an immense army of foreign troops and had given large subsidies to the princes of Germany. And in fact, yes, this is accurate as well. Britain hired German mercenaries to fight in the French and Indian War. Well, how are you going to pay for these guys? Well, to provide for the payment of these troops and subsidies, she almost doubled her debt. Great Britain almost doubled her debt. 
the interest on this debt is to be levied on the subjects residing in Great Britain. Now, all he's basically doing is stating the obvious. That's right. If you have a government that has bills to pay, uh, bills that come due, how is this going to get paid? How are they going to pay the German troops? Well, through taxes. And who pays the taxes? The subjects in the in Great Britain, in the empire. Now, he goes on to say, during the same war, the French and Indian War, Great Britain had embodied and paid a militia of more than 30,000 men. Yes, we know this from the historical record. Now, to raise these militia, he says, the ablest hands were taken from the farmer and the manufacturer of Britain. To pay them, the purses of the British subjects were drained. To find them winter quarters, the houses of the British subjects were crowded. Now, it's this interesting point that he makes here regarding the quartering of soldiers. And it wasn't initially always a bad thing. And then he further buttresses his position by saying this. Now, to what purpose this profusion of experience? In other words, this, this extravagant display of so many soldiers, these preternatural exertions of power, which is, in other words, of saying, why do we have uh, a rather unusual number of British troops surrounding the 13 colonies? That's a good question. He's, this is his answer, and you're going to love his rhetoric. To comply with the prayers of America, to conquer the enemies of America. In other words, we're here for you. He, he reminds them, he, he accuses them of having a, a, a memory lapse, of forgetting their own history, which is, which is really more like current events because this is recent uh, history for them. And he reminds them, this, this is what he says. And again, keep in mind, this is his justification for uh, the quartering of soldiers. And all this is in response to Thomas Jefferson's reference to the quartering of soldiers around the troops. It's an answer to prayer, Mr. Jefferson, is what Lynn would say. But look at how he builds it up even further. In the year 1754, now what you have to understand that the year 1754 was the beginning of the French and Indian War. So he gives them a little history lesson. Don't you remember? In the year 1754, the colonies acknowledged His Majesty's paternal care of the security of his good subjects of the provinces, represented that the encroach, and he's quoting them, the encroachments of the French threaten great danger, and perhaps in time, even the entire destruction of the colonies. Without the interposition of His Majesty, notwithstanding and provision they could make to prevent it, humbly, 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 they acknowledge, quote, their reliance on his majesty's paternal goodness that he would take effectual measures for the removal of the French. Remember at the start of this war, how you came and crawled to us begging for help? If we didn't intervene in the French and Indian War, the French and the Indians would destroy the 13 colonies? And then he says... Since the cause of their fears remove, in other words, the French and the Indian War, the British won, the threat is removed. They've discovered that it is all a mistake. What's a mistake? That they never had cause to fear and consequently that they can be under no obligation, that is no financial obligation to the British Empire for having removed basically a problem that never existed. So you also pick up the sarcasm Again, this is written in 1776, the sarcasm that he managed to uh, employ as he defends the quartering of soldiers. The 13 colonies have uh, basically forgotten their history here. And now that the uh, problem has been removed, uh, it's not even a, what have you done for me lately? It's just get out of town, get out of Dodge, get out of here. We don't need you anymore. We don't want you anymore. Now, at the end of the war though, where were the troops? What remained of these gallant troops after the multitude who had shed their blood in the cause of America? They were there amongst the colonies at the end of the war. So he asked a very good question. 
Was it too much to expect that these troops should be stationed a while in a country that they so had gallant defended? And he does a pretty good case here for the information he provides to make the 13 colonies appear unreasonable. They just saved you, they defended you, and this is how you show your gratitude? So he says, look, there's more to it than just a legal defense of the quartering of soldiers. It's also a very wise policy. He says, now it's not now the legality of the measure we are defending. It is the wisdom of the policy of it. And how is it a wise policy? Here then we may add that during the course of the war, His Majesty's dominions in America had been extended. New countries acquired, new subjects submitted to his government. It was but common policy to maintain such a military force as might ensure the allegiance of subjects who had so late, like, lately submitted. In other words, if you conquer new territory, you got to stick around to make sure that the conquered subjects are going to be loyal. And to stick around to make sure if there's any second thoughts of rebelling, then you have enough troops there to make sure and to remind them, no, we're in charge now and uh, we make the rules. So that's the part of the wisdom of keeping the soldiers around. And he also says this, this is not all though, peace was restored in Europe with the British uh, armies in there. Uh, peace was restored in Europe, but not to America. And but what by that he means that the French had laid down their arms, true, not so the Indians. They continued their incursions and depredations on the provinces of Virginia and Pennsylvania to quell the Indians, to drive them from their very people who now complain that the troops were stationed there were those very troops employed. And he says what the 13 colonies call a time of peace, in other words, it's the time of peace, get your soldiers out of here. It's really a war waging on their behalf, a war being waged on their behalf by the troops of the British crown King George III's troops at the sole expense of the crown. It's as if they're in denial of the 13 colonies, that they're still a real threat, that the only ones defending it really and paying for it surely is the British crown. This is a devastating critique of the one line of Thomas Jefferson's, because that's all he ever says about it for the quartering of troops around us. So let's quickly summarize John Lynn's defense of quartering of soldiers. Number one, the king is fully within his legal rights to put his soldiers, his soldiers, wherever he wants. It's his uh, territory, John Lynn reminds them. So everything he's doing is legal. It's not against the Constitution. Uh, and of course, Parliament is entirely for it. Of course, there were voices of opposition to certain parts of it, loyals. Uh, but the king wasn't doing anything illegal. Number two, the colonies are a subordinate legislature. They are lower in rank than the king or Parliament. So it's absurd to think that they can dictate terms. Number three. The colonies have to pay their fair share. Uh, and of course, this came out through the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, and of course, students learn about those as the taxes at levy on the 13 colonies. And of course, this is what John Lynn's argument is. You have to contribute to your own defense. Number four, the king's policies to station quarter troops in the colonies are not only legal, but they're also wise. And they're wise because the native population poses an ongoing threat to the 13 colonies. And therefore, the king must still keep troops on the ground because of the realities of, on the ground. So what was the big problem with the uh, Quartering Act? And there were two of them, too, not just one. So what was the big issue? Well, first of all, a little bit of context, historical context. Uh, according to Francis Lieber, he says it was formally believed. In other words, at this time, it was believed that the standing armies were incompatible with liberty. And there was even a very small one granted the King of England with much reluctance. That was the parliament there. Now he mentions the Bill of Rights and our own Declaration of Independence. And I've not said anything about the third amendment in the US constitution, which deals with the quartering of soldiers. I wanna stay with uh, the topic of John Lynn 
the response to the declaration, but on the declaration and the Bill of Rights, it does show how large a place the army occupied in the minds of the patriotic citizens and statements who drew up those historic documents and the reasons they had to mention it repeatedly and to erect fences against it. All of that to say is that there are really two reasons why the quartering acts were so problematic for the 13 colonies, two broad reasons. One of them was that there was uh, a fear that they pose, standing armies pose a threat to liberty. Now, you can go deep into the history and try and pinpoint the different attitudes among the colonies, and you'll find different shades of gray in terms of who strongly opposed it and who thought it wasn't that much of a threat to liberty. And you can also trace uh, historically the rise in opposition and the increase, the increasing uh, voices and chorus on this issue of were they a threat to liberty. So those are all valid things you can look at in terms of uh, getting a better, a clearer picture. But overall, in general, it's accurate to say that one of the broad uh, views, uh, one of the popular arguments against quoting of soldiers was this idea that they pose a real threat to liberty. Of course, we're so far removed, we don't really uh, have that issue in the sense of how they had it. So it's a little bit more difficult for us to relate to that. But the second reason is, is that uh, the colonies also started to really resent having to pay for the troops for different reasons at different times. But there was some pushback over paying. And there were some colonies that did go along with it as well. Uh, and, and so there are differences there, but overall it became an issue of uh, both liberty and having to pay. Uh, and if you looked at my previous video about the economic situation in the colonies, you'll see how that comes to play in terms of these, uh, these taxes continually being imposed on the colonies and their uh, struggle financially with uh, other issues that are imposed by the same British crown. So it's a, it's a complex subject is my point. And uh, the deeper you go into it, you see that it's not just the simple narrative that you get about the past at this time. So I hope I've been able to approach that. Uh, I hope I've been able to make that just a little bit more clear with, uh, with this series. But there's something else too about the quartering of soldiers. And this is the one that is, uh, it's somewhat difficult to, um, to think about because uh, it involves rape. Now, the American Revolution was a violent war, as all wars are. It, it tends to be presented in a more sanitized manner, particularly in grade school for obvious reasons. But um, there were some serious atrocities and historians who have looked at this uh, are, are not as common as the historians who uh, talk about the revolution and other aspects. Uh, one of the tragic stories that I want to briefly cover here has been written about by uh, a few historians, including Dorothy Mays in her book, Woman in Early America, Struggle, Survival, and Freedom in a New World. And I just want to read what she wrote so you can see uh, why there was hatred for the quartering of soldiers at this time, okay? This is about a 13-year-old girl who was raped by British redcoats. 13-year-old Abigail Palmer was repeatedly gang raped in her own home by British troops who harassed the family farm daily. Relatives who had tried to protect her were either beaten or raped as well. The violence did not stop until the soldiers brought Abigail and her 15-year-old cousin to camp where they, raped, where they were raped again until an officer took them to safety. I know for some of you in the audience there, you're going to immediately think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that, what about the American soldiers? Were, 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 weren't they also uh, guilty of the same? And historians have also, of course, looked at that side of it as well. But the consensus seems to be what uh, May says here in this section, soldiers in the American army committed far fewer rapes as soldiers rarely rape and harass their own people. When rape did occur by American soldiers, punishment was swift and severe as when General Washington ordered the execution of Thomas Brown for a second offense. In addition, General Washington knew the support on the home front 
would dissolve if his own troops were hostile to the population, prompting his 1777 order, which strictly forbids all the officers and soldiers of the Continental Army plundering any person, whether Tory or others, it is expected that humanity and tenderness to women and children will distinguish brave Americans contending for liberty from infamous mercenary ravages, whether British or Hessians. So there was somewhat of a difference. And so now you have a better sense of what John Lynn tried to do in response to Thomas Jefferson's phrase in the declaration that the reason they were breaking apart from King George was because of his quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. There were financial problems with that. There were concerns about liberty. And of course, there were the atrocities beyond just rudeness of having soldiers around, but rape as we saw. And hopefully now you have a better sense. Do you think John Lynn still carried the day? Obviously, we know from hindsight that uh, he was unsuccessful in persuading people, but hopefully you have a better sense of understanding some of the more complex issues of the founding of the nation with regard to some of the specific issues going on. It's a much more complex picture than uh, simple narratives would suggest. So I'm hoping that you will be motivated to even read further about some of these specific issues in particular, how they are mentioned in the declaration, because that will shed a lot of light on what specific factors were taking place to motivate a group of people to break away from the crown. That's all I have for now. So thank you for watching. And if you'd like to know more, be sure to read the notes that I left in the description with some links for additional information. Also, feel free to comment. I do want to know what you think, any thoughts that you might have. I'm looking forward to learning from you as well. And if you have some questions, go ahead and leave it there. And also, uh, I'll have a new video soon. In the meantime, if you want to make your life more pleasurable, feel free to hit the subscribe button. And remember, the past is never dead. It isn't even past.